Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen and students. Um, we shall we start it to the today's the WPI uh, Eisner's the uh, seminar series, and today we have the uh, very famous uh, professor from the uh, Tokyo area, and uh, <coughs> and uh, I hope you all you the enjoy to the today's talk. And uh, the, today's the uh, speaker is the Professor Makoto Misono, uh, President of Japan Union of Chemical Science and Technology, and Professor Emeritus of University of Tokyo. And uh, today's his title is Energy Strategies for the 21st Century and Green Chemistries. And as I mentioned, he is a <laughs> very uh, distinguished speaker and uh, world famous professor in the field of the catalyst. So I'm very pleased to have uh, his. Uh, simple, uh, his talk uh, in this symposium series. And uh, according to custom, I would like to briefly introduce the today's speaker's uh, bio brief. And uh, <coughs> Professor uh, Makoto Misono was born in 1939 in Kagoshima, the same island, this Kyushu. <laughs> and uh, given education of the science and engineering at the University of Tokyo and received his doctor engineering in 1966. He was a full professor of the University of of Tokyo from 1983 to 1999 and uh, <laughs> become the emeritus professor in 1999. And he joined Kogakuin University for 1999 to uh, 2005. Uh, this university also in the <laughs> uh, Shinjuku area. Then the, he became the uh, president of National Institute of Technology and uh, <coughs> Evaluation until 2009. He served as a member of the Science Council of Japan and the president of the Chemical Society of Japan. Um, now he is the president of Japan Union of Chemical Science and Technology, JUCST, and the vice president of Engineering Academy of Japan. Uh, his main interests are catalyst chemistry and the environmental science and technology, as well as uh, research integrities. And for me, the, I'm very familiar with Professor Misono from my student days. And for me, he is a very famous professor in the field of the uh, heteropoly acid catalyst. And uh, I have a lot of the learn from him. So today, I'm very pleased to have he, uh, the chair of his uh, presentations. So Professor Misono, please. Good afternoon. Thank you, Professor Chihara, for a very kind introduction. It is uh, my great honor to present a lecture at the, on this occasion. And uh, I am very much grateful to the professors and sta staffs of the Kyushu University for giving me this opportunity. My talk this afternoon is uh, Energy Strategy and Green Chemistry for the 21st Century. The subject is very large and general. And uh, so what I can talk is, is just a few aspect of this broad subject. And this is not a very scientifically sophisticated talk, so you can be relaxed and uh, listen. If you don't like, you can sleep. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, this slide explains basic concept behind my lecture today. A uh, key question is, can we achieve a sustainable society, probably using hydrogen, I'm not, not sure. Uh, and that this picture is uh, so-called environmental Kuznets curve. Have you heard of this? Uh, Kuznets is an economist or a, a professor of economics who was awarded a Nobel Prize. So must be a big scientist. And uh, he discussed about the income gap between the relationship between income gap and economical development. Uh, but recently, this curve is often applied to environmental issues and therefore called environmental Kuznets curve. This shows that as the economic, economic develops, environmental impacts or other risks increases generally. But at certain point, 
the developed country tried to make U-turn. So although economic development proceeds, but the environmental impact decreases. Particularly, developing countries are quickly following developed countries. If all the countries go to this way, ours cannot survive. So we need to change, we need to cooperate, make this U-turn possible. But this is only a hope. Actually, for, for, for example, nitrogen oxides or sulfur oxides are really decreasing in developed, in developed countries very quickly by the enforced regulations and by advanced technologies. But as you know well, carbon dioxide continue to increase in spite of various efforts we have made. That is the, true, the real world. So, the, so in this world, any action may increase the environmental impacts, at least at present. So the, my, the question is, is this U-turn possible and under the, those difficult conditions? And uh, so my talk is just show you some examples and let us think about of this together. That's the basic concept of my, uh, basic concept behind my lecture. So as I mentioned, the, this is not a very scientific or very academic topic, but it's a general topic for all the human beings now and they just discuss the, uh, the think about together. Before we do that, uh, I'd like to show you how to make U-turn is difficult or any action may increase the environmental impact. This is the first exercise. Uh, the question is, can electric car or fuel cell car, I don't know. This is a case of electric cars can s save energy or CO2 emission. I'm considering one small electric vehicle, although I don't mention the name. Uh, here, the, the cost performance of CO2 reduction is compared using published data. During driving, about eight ton of CO2 emission can be reduced by using an electric, electric car for uh, 100,000 kilometer driving. That is almost uh, one life of car. And if you use electric car, only you use is electricity. If you use gasoline car, the CO2 is produced by the combustion of gasoline. I compared, those data are very open and we can make access to those. And if you calculate by using electric car, eight ton of CO2 can be reduced. Okay, that's okay, but if you consider the difference of the price between electric car and gasoline car, that's more than three million yen. So if you divide this amount, uh, the, the, that price difference by this amount, the cost for the reduction of one ton of CO2 is, uh, how do you say, 300 and, no, 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 380,000 yen. So very expensive. In addition to that, CO2 is emitted during the production of the car. That must be not small. That data are not available, but we are bold enough to estimate that amount just comparing the GDP of Japan to CO2 emission of Japan. If we apply that ratio to the price difference, it becomes about eight ton. That means CO2 reduction is negligible. That means the cost is, becomes almost infinite. So I'm not saying that electric car has no future. But 
electric car we have now is not so efficient to reduce CO2 and very ex expensive toy for rich people. But recently, that company announced the price, much lower price. If that price is applied, the cost for uh, CO2 reduction is not infinite, 600,000 yen. Still very expensive. Okay, that's a way I'm talking, <laughs> going to talk about the energy strategy. So now I start the first half of my talk that is about energy strat strategy for the 21st century. The key issues are energy supply, is it enough? Or is that energy good for global warming? That this is a very key uh, question when we think about energy strategy. First, the, the second exercise. You, to clear out the illusion we may have. The question is, can we directly sense or feel global warming? Uh, some of you can feel the increasing the global temperature. My answer is no. The reason is that the average temperature rise of the Earth is this amount, according to the published data. This is much smaller than the daily or annual change of the temperature. So we, we can never sense the increase of the temp temperature of the Earth. We feel the temperature rise every day, but it's not due to the result of global warming. And the second is that, I don't know, that some years ago, we often saw the glacier fell down on TV. But glacier is a river, so it should happen when the glacier go into the ocean or river. It naturally has to break down. So that's, this is quite natural phenomena. So that does not mean we can see global warming. Nothing to do with that. The third one is, this is another very famous story which was, which was popular some years ago. We, we saw rather often the sinking island in the Southern Pacific. But the observed increase reported for the sea level is only this amount. So that kind of phenomena you may have seen on TV may happen, but is not due to the global warming. So, okay. So now I hope you uh, you can escape. You have you can have escaped from the, uh, some kind of illusions. Now I would like to discuss about what kind of energy we should choose for the 21st century. That is my personal opinion. And although I believe that is, uh, that is correct, uh, to discuss that, we must uh, make sure what are the important criteria for the selection of primary energy. I'm not talking about secondary energy like hydrogen, talking about primary energy. The first, the quantity of supply, how much we can supply or how much it start to decline. And time scale, the second time scale, when it happens, in two years or 10 years, 30 years. The number three is economy, what is cost? I just, we just think, thought about uh, the cost performance of CO2. We should the examine the cost performance uh, when we choose energy. And the number four is the environment for convenience to use and the material or energy balance. I think at least these three, the first three of the six criteria I showed in the previous slide, time scale, quantity, and economy. Those three are three important criteria at any time we discuss about uh, future energy source. For example, as for fossil fuels, when will it decline or be depleted? 
And uh, when will new renewable energy spread? When and uh, how much? That's very important. Another th things uh, in relation to time scale is given here. Usually, life cycle assessment is applied for the steady state. But in some cases, transient state is rather important. When you uh, fix solar cells on your house, CO2 emission takes place when it is produced. And it starts to reduce the CO2 uh, emission in much later state. So this figure interprets that when you install solar cells at steady state, the energy consumption for the production of that increases linearly with time. And the amount of CO2 reduction or the amount of energy saving increases in a parabolic way. So sometime there is crossover. But after that, that uh, equipment start to save energy or start to reduce CO2 emission. For example, the energy payback time is three years. The crossover point will be six years. So we need to compare the during period of the equipment when we discuss this kind of energy balance. And uh, uh, another point regarding the quantity is one of the three important criteria is that uh, share in the total energy. In the 20th century, population increased three times. Energy consumption per capita increased four times. Therefore, the total energy consumption increased more than 10 times in the 20th century. So we are, we are using, we are consuming huge amount of energy now. So if you look at the primary energy supplied at present, 80% of the energy is from fossil fuel. And 10% from so-called conventional biomass like uh, charcoal, uh, wood, etc. And this is nuclear and hydro. And only a very small amount is so-called new renewable energies. For example, solar energy in the world primary energy supplies 0.02% at present. But I'm not saying the future of solar cell is nothing. <laughs> at present, like this. And it takes time to be uh, sifted. To, for the solar cell to contribute to considerable or significant amount. That is the point I would like to uh, mention. So therefore, future of fossil fuel and nuclear energy depends, ah, no, no, de not therefore. Another point I would like to say is the reserves as, and also global warming. Fossil fuels will not be depleted in the 21st century, as I explained briefly later. But the its use depends on the risk of global warming, because consumption of fossil fuel, which shares 80% of the primary energy we are using, almost equal to the CO2, amount of CO2 emission. And then the reserves to production ratio in Japanese kasainens for oil, coal, natural gas, uh, this is non-conventional oil and gas, and uranium, it is quite high. Someone is very, someone uh, very worrying about uh, so-called peak oil. It will start to decline very soon. But as far, so oil, is the most uh, uncertain energy source. But 
still it has 40 years of R to P ratio. This is very variable. You, we discover new field we use that the difference between the new, newly found uh, reserve and the amount of consumption is a change of the uh, R to P ratio. So this is vari variable, variable one. It may increase, it may decrease. But in the past 40 years, it, uh, it hasn't decreased so far. So I think there is no indication of oil depletion. Someone may uh, oppose to my opinion, but uh, so far there is no indication. I accept that the amount of oil is limited, but depletion will not will not take, take place in the near future. If you look at the data, coal increases very much, natural gas and oil increase steadily in the past, and there is no indication to make U-turn in the near future. Okay. Then another important issue is global warming. But what is the truth about it? It may take a long time to discuss, and it's very difficult to have a consensus. But still, I would like to point out that climate change in the past and its causes are very uncertain, not either, quite uncertain. For example, the reliability of the temperature data in the past is now questionable, and influence of other factors seem to be significant. For example, two, it was two years ago, or the climate gate scandal took place. So this is now very controversial. What is the truth? And all. so it's uncertain. And uh, what is more important is the risk of global warming in the future. Nobody has been able to assess this. In, so this is very much uncertain. So what I would like to point out here is that what is very important is choose appropriate measures in the uncertainty. That is a question we must answer now. So what I would propose is that the measures should be neither too less nor too much. Both cases would bring about very harmful results. We should choose appropriate measures. In urgent and dangerous cases, powerful and quickly effective drugs with side effects may be necessary. For example, if you have a very serious cancer inside, you may take very strong with probable side effects may be necessary. But, but in uncertain cases, I would propose slowly effective Chinese medicine to cure the problem. And, and moderate measures, including mitigation, adaptation, and remedy may be desirable. Someone say high goal, set a high goal, and try to uh, realize that is a beautiful action. But I would say it might be dangerous. And another point I'd like to point out is, as I mentioned already, the cost, cost performance is also very important. If the performance is the same, certainly choose less expensive measures. I think nobody opposed to that. So let me consider cost of reduction of one ton of CO2. I, as I already, already showed you that uh, CO2 reduction by using uh, present electric car, one kind of electric car is very, very expensive. This is another example, cost of uh, CO2 reduction using solar cell. So here compared the conventional electricity and uh, solar cell. The CO2 emission 
is much greater for the conventional CO2, uh, power generation. So it, uh, the difference is this amount. And however, the cost of electricity, according to published data, 45 yen for so, so solar cell and uh, conventional electricity is about this. So the dif uh, difference is this amount. If you divide this by this, the cost becomes 100,000 yen for the reduction of one ton of CO2. But in addition to that, if the solar cell or wind power also spread very much, we need to install batteries to adjust the fluctuation of energy supply. It may cost. This is very uncertain either. If at the cost of storage, uh, storage battery, the amount, the cost would be this. This amount is 100 times the price of emission tray. So this is another very expensive measure to reduce CO2 emission. And I summarized several examples. I tried to assess. And most of them, there are many, several ideas to uh, reduce CO2, but those are very expensive as compared to the price of the emission trade. I'm not saying that this is a cost is the only factor to determine the energy, to choose energy, but cost is one important, one of the important criteria. So as far as cost is cons uh, considered at present, most of them are very expensive. So I'm not saying, I'm not saying this shouldn't be chosen, but we need to know that they are very expensive at present. Probably we can find other value, values other than cost, money, or we need to put, invest more money for research and development than spreading any of those technology now. So summarizing what I said and uh, or uh, what I wish to say, fossil fuels, the low cost and convenience to use, would be main primary energy until the middle of the 21st century. Play would play important roles after that in the second half of the 21st century. This is my personal opinion. Uh, although I can't guarantee that, and uh, probably I'm not uh, alive at that time. <laughs> and uh, what is important is so-called adaptive, adaptive management. Flex, adjust flexibly or moni uh, adjust flexibly the measure monitoring the climate change. As for nuclear, low cost, low combo, and easy storage. So this is very pr promising. Uh, future energy except uh, uh, security, uh, safety and uh, treatment of the used fuel. As for the new renewable energies in general would spread pro probably from the middle of the 21st century. This is, uh, this is another opinion of mine. So what is necessary now is not putting tax to spread, but put tax for research and development of the technology for solar cell or other uh, renewable energies. And this is about uh, secondary energy. I think. A few words for hydrogen. Ah, I just uh, saw the research facilities of the hydrogen center uh, with uh, Professor Muraka. This is very uh, marvelous and doing very important things as far as I, I understood. I think that kind of long-term research and development is very necessary now, even for other new energies, not to force them spread using the tax of the 
poor people. <laughs> now, I, let me go to the second half of my lecture. It's extension of the first half of my lecture. It's about the chemistry and the green chemistry. Before I talk about that, let me show you two slides. One is, is to tell you that this year is an international year of chemistry. Uh, Madame Curie received her second prize, 100, a second Nobel Prize, 100 years ago, uh, 1911. I, I so we are doing, we are doing many things in Japan as well as in other countries. Uh, we have several goals. And another slide I'd like to show you here is that materials, materials or chemical technologies are very important for innovation. As you see, the transition from vacuum tube LSA or silver halide photography to digital camera. All of these big innovation is accompanied by the change or by new material technology or new processing technology. So material technology as well as chemical technology are in a very important for the future innovation. Now let me return to green chemistry. Green chemistry is in a word environmentally friendly chemical technology. What is important? So what is env environmentally friendly? But I will uh, explain you later. In the concept of green chemistry, process and uh, products are designed in advance before R&D is started to minimize the environmental impact or chemical risks. So this is, uh, in green chemistry, precaution is emphasized rather than cure. This is a basic uh, the precautionary measures are the basic concept of uh, uh, green chemistry. And this is a equation. This means population. <laughs> I hope you understand population. So this uh, canceled. So this equation holds at any time. And uh, the last time population increases in the world, the GDP divided by population is the economic standard, which also improves in the future. So in, in order to decrease the environmental impact or chemical risks, we need to decrease this time very much. That is uh, electro, uh, environmental impact or chemical risks divided by the GDP. That each economic action that those economic, for example, environmental impact caused by each economic action must be suppressed very, very much. Otherwise, the environmental impact in the world will decrease, uh, increase. So we can realize the U-turn I showed you before. So, okay. And green chemistry, the word green, of green chemistry was invented in the 90s in the United States and spread all over the world. But in Japan, I would like to stress that uh, before the world of green chemistry was invented, we have many good, excellent uh, chemical technologies which are environmentally friend friendly. That's uh, because of the, we had a lot of problem in Japan uh, caused by chemical industry about uh, 40 years ago, 40 years ago, when I was a graduate student. But as I mentioned, one good example is a paper pulp industry in Japan, which suppressed uh, uh, dramatically the BOD emitted into river. In the 1970, the total amount of BOD uh, emitted into the river is this amount. The most of them is from industry, and half of that is f from paper and pulp industry. But after 20 years, total amount decreased very much. 
although the BOD from houses did not decrease not so much. That means those made a lot of efforts to decrease uh, BOD in the, in the 20 years. And one of my friends uh, analyzed the change, and according to her, he received the Punkakoro shot. <laughs> she received a very high ranked uh, uh, prize recently. She was my classmate. And according to her, the most success was made enabled by changing the chemical process and feedstock of paper. So this is a very good example of green chemistry. So, and as to assess the chemical processes of friendliness to the environment, E factor was proposed by Professor Sheldon several years, um, maybe 20, maybe 15 years ago. According to him, the chemical products are divided into four classes. The first one is oil refinery, and the production is very huge. And then basic chemicals, fine chemicals, to the uh, very much value-added chemicals, like medical, agrochemical, electro, or electronics materials or optical materials. The amount of production decrease very much from the top to the bottom. But if you compare, the, this is a factor. That is a ratio of byproduct to the main product of that process. Oil refin refinery produces byproduct about 10% of the main product. This is a very rough number. But in base chemicals, byproducts and the main product are of the same comparable order. If you go to those almost 100 times large, larger amount of byproducts are formed because of the many steps to synthesize, for example, uh, liquid crystal. I had my friend who was doing research in the company at that time yeah, in his case, it's almost 1,000 times. Although they are producing mainly byproducts, the price of liquid crystal is so high, so that company can make money. But later on, it much improved, I guess. But still, they are producing a lot of byproducts. And what is important is that those items in the lower lines are more valuable. So developed companies are more interested in those products. And you may think if you multiply this and this, the byproducts may be small. But in this case, each product may be small, but there are many kinds of products. So if you combine all of the products, the amount of byproducts must be very huge. So we may need to make this if effect much lower by uh, chemical technology. That is uh, uh, E factor uh, to measure the one measure of the green greenness of chemical processes. I, I don't measure much about, I explain much about this, but we have many good industrial successes in Japan as well as in abroad. I'll show you only one example that is uh, realized but, uh, by a Japanese company. That's the production of the raw material, monomer of nylon 6. In conventional process, concentrated sulfuric acid is used, which is a very good reagent. And the reaction process smoothly and rather selectively. But Inevitably, if you use sulfuric acid, it must be removed by making ammonium sulfate. So in this case, to produce one ton of this monomer, 
2.5 ton of ammonium sulfate is being produced. Still it is produced now. So to replace this process by a, a selective catalytic process, process is a long dream of uh, uh, the engineer and scientist in the field of catalysis. I was one of them, but uh, this was made possible by uh, chemist or uh, chemical engineers of a Japanese chemical company. And uh, now the byproducts became zero by using this process. And this is one example of the uh, plant of that company. This is the main idea, used to be the main idea of uh, green chemistry. There are very uh, good examples. Another example I may, may mention is uh, a new method to produce polycarbonate. In conventional processes, phosgen, which is very toxic, is used, still being mainly used. One Japanese company and another company, which is a joint venture between the United States and Japan, succeeded to produce this without using phosgen. And it was very successful. So decrease, suppress the byproduct or not use toxic reagent is uh, goals of green chemistry and there are many successful examples in, in the past. I, I would like to mention about green feedstock and uh, I will show you an example of biomass. Biomass is thought to be one promising green feedstock it depends on the case. Sometimes it's very green and sometimes it's not green. There are several successful cases, but all of these, are, some people think that if you use biomass for feed, feedstock, it's always green. That is not true. The successful case is only when the structure of biomass are used, you, oh, how do you say? If you take advantage of the structure of biomass, it would be good reason to succeed. The another necessary condition to succeed is to use the byproducts. For example, if we produce bioethanol from uh, uh, sugar cane or uh, timber, 90% would be byproducts. Only you can get 10% of bioethanol. So what is important? How to use the rest? If you use that for fertilizers or energies, it could be successful. That is a very important point to think about green chemistry. Think or hold the life cycle and think outside the system you are thinking about. For example, if you use biomass for energy, I would say it is not promising. If you consider this ratio, energy gain ratio is very important. Uh, this is the energy of bioethanol produced over fossil energy used to produce this. There's a many assessment in the world. The results are quite different from one to another, but this is thought to be relatively reliable. According to that, in the case of corn, in the case of bioethanol production from corn in the United States, the ratio is only 1.3. That means only you get 30% increase. And if you consider other things to maintain the environment and etc. This would be almost uh, zero. And in the United States, from the stand, standpoint of energy policy, to produce ethanol from corn is meaningless. Probably good for the, to protect the agriculture. But if you produce bioethanol from sugar cane in Brazil now, 
the ratio is seven. That means you get a lot of based on six times uh, more energy than you used to produce it. So this is okay. But in this case, as I mentioned before, the byproducts are used for fertilizers and for energy. And at the same time, uh, without using electricity, man and uh, cattle work. So in that case, you don't need to use a lot of fossil fuel. But in the United States, it's more, in the States, in the United States, modern industry and agriculture is popular. So you need to use a lot of fossil fuel to produce biothanol. And another thing I would like to mention is that biofuel is very scarce or the density is very low. If all grain of the world are converted to biofuel, which only covers only four or five percent of the total energy. And I think all forests in Japan. Japan is uh, full of forests. One of, probably one of the two, big, two or three biggest uh, forest countries. If the all energy of Japan is uh, supplied by uh, forest, all mountains will be bare in two years. This is a calculation made by the professor of uh, faculty of uh, agriculture of the University of Tokyo, so maybe reliable. And if you would convert it to bioethanol, it happens in two months. This means how biomass is reliable for the energy source, or it means that how, many, how, much, how huge energy we are using. And one person said, a nuclear power, this is a very touchy issue. But a nuclear power, one nuclear power plant equal to the solar cells fueled inside Yamate line in Tokyo. That is almost comparable. And one uh, ex meti person uh, wrote an article in the newspaper. And I calculate that, that this is almost uh, true. So that is, energy density is uh, not high. For. Then I'd like to try to conclude uh, my talk about green chemistry by forecasting the future of green chemistry. I think as a guiding principle for to, meet, to meet world needs from now and compete globally, expansion of the GC concept is necessary. I point out these four points for the future green chemistry. I'll explain one by one. First, comprehensive assessment is necessary. If you assess locally, it may be green, but which could be black, wasteful, or red, harmful, if you consider the entire system. That is a very important point. And the second is how to make to how, what to make. In the past, green chemistry is very much concerned about the chemical processes. But from now, what to make and why to make will, will be more important. For example, there are many products around us which could be made greener. What I like is paper diaper. You know this. This is a very good chemical invention and which made uh, our life very young, uh, a baby, and all people like me more comfortable. I'm not using that yet. <laughs> <laughs> and another thing is that another reason why the product is important may be seen from this. 
as I mentioned, to evaluate the greenness, energy consumption, and CO2 emission during pro production must be considered. Now, recently, ICCA, that is the International Council of, Council of Chemical Industry Associations, so there could be some bias. But according to that, they assessed, asked McKinsey to assess carbon LCA. That means if you pick up one chemical product, how much CO2 is emitted during production and how much CO2 is reduced by using that product and uh, summing up all the products. This is a very tough and uh, not very much reliable could be. But according to that uh, assessment, if you consider all chemical products, the reduction of CO2 by using the chemical products is two to three times greater than the CO2 emitted during the production. This is a good sign for us. We thought we, if we do something, any action would increase the CO2 emission. But if this assessment is correct, we can hope that if you produce environmentally friendly products, that would contribute to the reduction of CO2 or energy saving. And another point I'd like to point is the problem of the parts and systems. I'll show you this slide. What, what I wish to say is that, for example, electric uh, compliances in the household, uh, washing machine, refrigerator, all of them, the efficiency well, has been improved maybe more than two times in the past. However, the total consumption of energy by houses or ho at home increased more than two times in the past 20 years. Although the electric appliances has much better efficiency. So, even if you increase or improve the efficiency of each part of the system, whole energy consumption may increase very much. In this case, the number of families increased in Japan. You know, the family size decreased. And another reason that each family has more than two refrigerators, uh, maybe one refrigerator or two, and uh, uh, many air conditioners. Most increases due to air conditions. It increased uh, seven times in the past 20 years. So I think we need to change the social systems or lifestyle. Otherwise, even we try hard to increase, uh, improve the efficiency of each part in the system, total consumption energy may not be decreased. So we need to focus the entire system in order to substantially suppress the energy consumption or CO2 emission. Okay, I'll skip this. And uh, the last point uh, I'd like to point out as for green, future green chemistry is, for example, in the past 10 years, we are very much concerned about the negative factors of chemical process or products. That is environment impacts, chemical risk, and cost. For example, the, I didn't explain, but the uh, eco efficiency index uh, used by BASF only considers these two. But from now to the future, we should consider more about more positive as aspect of uh, materials or chemical industry. From the, redefinition of happiness may be necessary. Uh, but still, we should uh, stress the positive aspect of industry, in my case, chemical industry. But this is originally like that. All industry 
all industries attempted to make the society more convenient and more comfortable. So we now we return positively to the positive side of aspect of industry. That is, uh, uh, like I mentioned at the last of green chemistry uh, story. So summarizing what I have said and what I wish to say, the U-turn in the original Kuznets curve may be very difficult, although in spite of many efforts we, may, we have made and we will make. Probably not only this vertical axis, but also we should reconsider the horizontal axis. Maybe if you take this, it will be very difficult to make this U-turn. We need to rethink the meaning of our happiness, and uh, this scale may be changed. In the last uh, a couple of slides, I'd like to mention about uh, this is an uh, appendix. Uh, it, I'd like to mention about the relationship uh, or the role of the scientists, engineers in the society. As all of you know, and I also agree, that community of scientists and engineers are in the society, inevitably. And we go with the society, we go together with the society and for the society. And the roles of scientists, engineers, are two ways. One is to create novel science and technology. And the second, there's another important role of scientists and engineers. That is to provide the society with rational scientific judgment or rational scientific criteria for the society to judge. I think this is a fundamental ethics of scientists and engineers. That is now strongly requested. And uh, lessons from the 3-11 disaster. Every time we drink recently, we discuss a long time about this. <laughs> you know, so every time we drink my with my friends, tonight we don't discuss this. But after one or two hours, we start to discuss this. <laughs> I think that the disaster told us that we should re-examine the role of science and technology in the society. That is a fundamental ethics of scientists and engineers, just I mentioned. One is, according to my personal opinion, the way to face, how to face the nature. We realize how huge the power of the nature. We may change the design of sciences and technology for the future. That is one point. And another point is uh, lessons we are learning from the accident of a nuclear power plant. The one is the safety technology. You may have many opinions or thoughts about this. The, what, have the, what, was, what were done before the accident was uh, not uh, perfect. But what I am very much concerned about is the procedure or policy or strategy after the accident. Accident may take place, even if you have made many things. What is important? I was working for a National Institute of Technology, and which is a governmental institution taking care of the safety of products of daily life. So we are discuss. We often discuss about how to secure safety, safety of the small products. And what is important is to do best things to prevent accident. But even if you did many things, accident could happen. What is important is also, also important is to minimize the influence of the accident which happened. In this case, 
that is very uh, that is very poor. That is a uh, I am very worrying about that, and we need to reconsider the safety technology. And the second is energy. Nucle nu replacing nuclear power and uh, spreading renewable energy is proposed by uh, Prime Minister of some country, but it is uh, unrealistic and not wise. That means stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and the last one is uh, science communication, particularly in the case of uh, nuclear or radiation, uh, the general public, including me, did not know much about uh, the influence of radiation, etc. So we still, even my friends who, who, who are supposed to be an expert in uh, chemistry, or one of my friends is an ex-president of a chemical company, even he or she or they are very scared by the amount of radiation near Tokyo. Yeah. Some other people don't uh, care about it. This is almost nothing. So the opinion is quite spread. There, there is a very, it is very difficult to find a consensus or acceptable consensus among the people. That is a very sad story, story in Japan. So the science communication must be reconsidered and enforced. Particularly, particularly from the side of scientists and the engineers. The, the, those are the concluding remarks of my talk. Responsibility of science technology, fundamental ethic, and we need a realistic vision and roadmap of energy. And those three are very important uh, criteria. New green chemistry, more positive one, and system reformation, not only part, may be necessary. That is uh, what I wish to say. Thank you very much.